Okay, hello and welcome to our next lecture. Uh, where we left off last time was in chapter five and um, specifically section 5.8 where we're talking about the relationship of various aspects of gases to the um, tenets of the kinetic molecular theory. And uh, we've gone over uh, things like Boyle's Law and Charles Law and Avogadro's Law and Dalton's Law uh, last time. We were now up to the point where we need to talk a little about um, temperature and molecular velocities. Uh, thermal energy, we know, results in uh, movement of particles. And that's generally true of any material in any state of matter. Because in liquids and solids, the particles are basically stuck to each other through intermolecular attractions, um, the particles are more or less fixed in place, and most of that movement takes the form of vibration in place. So uh, in solids especially, the particles don't really move around and past one another, but they vibrate in place. In liquids, they're uh, uh, able to move around and past one another, to some extent with some resistance because they're so close together, but um, again, they're also vibrating in place. In gases, uh, the particles are very free to move, as we've already mentioned, because there are no intermolecular attractions. So in gases, we have no intermolecular attractions, and so there's nothing to hold gases back, or you know, the particles that make up a gas. There's nothing to hold them back. The particles that make up a gas are, uh, you know, because of the lack of intermolecular attractions, the individual particles that make up a gas are free and independent of each other, which means they are very small. And as a result of that uh, and the, the other factors, the uh, gas particles move very fast, even at relatively low temperatures. and they have both translational and vibrational movement. So translational movement is moving place to place and vibrational would be in place. So even while they're moving from one place to another, the particles are still vibrating. <clears throat> well, some of these um, uh, tenets that I just mentioned, like gas particles being very small, and so it doesn't take much thermal energy to get them moving, and having no attraction to other gas particles, so there's nothing holding them back, those are tenets of the kinetic molecular theory, uh, ones that we've actually mentioned from the very beginning, even before we introduced the kinetic molecular theory, uh, because those properties are so important as properties of gases. Uh, all gas particles would have the same average kinetic energy at a given temperature. So for example, what I'm saying is that um, av the average kinetic energy of particles of argon, 
would be equal to the average kinetic energy of molecules of CO2. if the temperatures are the same. So it doesn't really matter what, in terms of kinetic energy, it doesn't really matter what the gas is. It's really just the thermal energy, the temperature, and the temperature is a measure of the thermal energy. So it's really just the temperature or the thermal energy that determines what the average kinetic energy is. And if you remember back to our definition of what temperature is, a temperature is a measurement of the average kinetic energy of the particles in a sample. And so if you think of it like that, this definition is actually kind of circular. Yeah. Of course, if the um, measurement of the average kinetic energy is the same, then the average kinetic energy is going to be the same. It makes sense, right? But you know, that's that. It's an aspect that, that we probably wouldn't have thought of if I didn't say it explicitly. So, if, if two gas samples have the same temperature, they have the same average kinetic energy. That does now having the same average kinetic energy does not mean that the particles have the same velocity, because kinetic energy de de um, depends on both mass and temperature. The uh, equation for kinetic energy is kinetic energy is one half m v squared. So for any given particle, its kinetic energy is going to be one half its mass times its velocity squared. So if the particles have different masses, have the same kinetic energy, they have different velocities. So just to recap what we've said so far, if the particles of gas are at the same temperature, they have the same average kinetic energy. But they don't have the same average velocity unless their masses are the same. And because kinetic energy is mass times velocity. So basically, if uh, one of them has a bigger mass, it's going to have a smaller velocity. Or if the uh, mass is less, it'll have a greater velocity. So in other words, lighter particles travel faster uh, than heavier ones at a given temperature. And that's on average. Okay, we have this concept called root mean square velocity. And it's kind of a way that's used statistically to compare the average velocities of, uh, well, particularly for gases. And it's equal to what's well, called URMS. Uh, for some reason, they've chosen to use U for velocity instead of a V, uh, you know, just to be not too obvious about things, I guess. And it's the square root 
of the average velocity squared. And this is where u with the line over it squared is the average of the squares of the particle velocities. And like I said, this is kind of similar to the average velocity. Um, so we can think of it in those terms. The average kinetic energy is equal to one half Avogadro's number times m u bar squared or in other words, three halves RT. And uh, rearranging this a little bit, that's, uh, those, this is just sort of showing you how we get to the final conclusion. Uh, after a couple of more steps of rearrangement, we find that another way of calculating the root mean square velocity is by taking the square root of 3RT over the molar mass. So let's go over, and actually this is a much more useful um, expression for the root mean square velocity because doing it the, the way that I originally showed as the square root of the average of the squares of the particle velocities, um, it's really difficult to measure the, the velocities of individual particles, particularly if you're going to measure a large enough uh, sample of velocities to be representative of an entire sample of gas, which has probably got a lot of particles in it. <clears throat> You'd need to measure billions and billions of particle velocities uh, in order to have a representative sampling of the um, uh, gas particles in even a very small sample. So uh, being able to use this method is actually much easier because we know what three is, obviously. We know what R is, we know what T is, that's the temperature, and we know what the molar mass is if we know what gas it is. And so, first of all, R is the universal gas constant. It's a constant, but that doesn't mean that it's always the same number. Okay, this is where things get kind of interesting. For contexts in which you're dealing with energies, R takes the value of 8.314 joules over moles kelvins. And it's in the context of things like pressure versus volume or temperature versus volume. That's when R takes the other value, the 0 0.082057 liter atmospheres over moles Kelvins. And it's easy, well, it's easy to remember if you have the units in front of you because this, the unit for this value of R involves joules. That's energy, right? Velocity would be related to energy. And uh, on the other hand, the uh, units for the other value of R are liter atmospheres over moles kelvins, and liters and atmospheres have to do with pressure and volume. And so that's when you would use that value. So you know, again, watch the units and you should be okay. Temperature is uh, uh, T, and, but that does need to be absolute temperature. And mm is molar mass. The book uses uh, kind of a fancy capital M for molar mass, but um, when I try to make it, it doesn't look that different from my regular capital M's. So I decided to use mm for molar mass instead. That way it's a little harder to um, mix things up. <clears throat> 
as long as you realize that I'm not talking about millimeters here. Uh, but there'd be no reason that I would be talking about millimeters in an equation like this. Uh, so anyway, looking at this equation, it's made up entirely of things that we can find pretty easily. <clears throat> um, and we can get some relationships out of this. The root mean square velocity of the particles is proportional to the square root of the temperature in Kelvins. Okay, so that's what that means. The root mean square velocity is proportional to the square root of the absolute temperature. Also, we can see that um, the root mean square velocity is proportional to one over the molar mass, or the square root that is of one over the molar mass. Or in other words, uh, root mean square velocity is inversely proportional, uh, inversely proportional to the square root of the molar mass. Okay. So that's another thing we can learn from that equation. And that makes sense because, um, it, well, at least uh, you know, in general terms, it makes sense because you would normally, uh, URMS again is basically like the average velocity of the particles in a gas. And you would generally expect the particles to be moving faster as the gas gets hotter because things speed up when they get hot. So that makes sense. And this makes sense also because uh, basically the bigger the gas particles are, the slower they move. They have a certain amount of energy, and if they have a bigger mass, then they're going to have less velocity. Smaller mass will be a greater velocity. As an example of the kind of numbers you get out of these calculations, The root mean squared velocity for nitrogen molecules at 25 degrees Celsius, which is about room temperature, is 515 meters per second, which probably doesn't mean much uh, to most of us. But in terms that we might understand better, it's 1,152 miles per hour. So that, you know, that's pretty fast, 1,152 miles per hour. That's about twice as fast as a jet airplane, you know, a passenger uh, jet airplane. <clears throat> uh, they go about half that fast. And they're pretty fast. So the nitrogen particles are zipping around you in the room are even faster. And um, we don't really notice them hitting us because they're so tiny. And uh, as, if there's no draft or no wind, then um, they're moving in random directions and we'll be hitting, getting hit equally from all sides by these tiny little particles zipping around at high speed. And so we don't really notice an effect uh, that's uneven from one side to another or anything like that. To demonstrate the smaller particles move faster, if you look at the um, root mean squared velocity for hydrogen at 25 degrees Celsius, it would be about 1920 meters per second, or about four times faster than nitrogen. And in miles per hour, that's 4,295, 4,295 miles per hour. So that is, again, really, really fast. 
so what we've just done is we've seen how to calculate the root mean square velocity for um, uh, gas particles. And um, we might as well actually try an example for that before we actually go on. Um, So we could say, how about um, how about the root mean square velocity of carbon dioxide at um, something a little closer to actual room temperature, 21 degrees Celsius? OK, so we need for the root mean squared velocity, square root of 3RT over molar mass. <clears throat> That's going to be square root of 3 times 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And temperature is 21 degrees Celsius. which uh, is uh, 294K. And the um, molar mass is, uh, molar mass needs, oh, I forgot to mention, molar mass needs to be in kilograms per mole. That's why I, ju I just remembered that. So that's why I was checking my notes to see. Uh, yeah, it does uh, molar mass needs to be in kilograms per mole. So um, for CO2, it's 44 grams per mole. And there's one kilogram for every thousand grams. So that's 0 0.044 kilograms per mole. Because kilogram is the SI unit for mass. Uh, so 0.044. Okay. So if we take 3 times 8.314 times 294 equals, and then divide by 0.044, we get this number. Uh, if you want to see it, there it is. Um, and then we raise that to the 0.5 power, and we get 408. Uh, let's see, for yeah, for significant figures, we're already over. So I'm going to leave it at 408 meters per second. Now, in terms of mass, carbon dioxide is heavier than nitrogen, so it should be slower than nitrogen. And in fact, you notice it is 408 versus 515. So the velocity makes sense. All right, so that's how you can find that out. And OK, moving on, what I was just writing when I decided to do an example of this is that not all the particles in a gas sample will have the same velocity at a given temperature. There's a distribution. Uh, of velocities, which means that a few of them, a few particles, will move relatively slowly. And a few will move relatively quickly. And most are somewhere in between. The uh, distribution is uh, usually described as a bell curve, where you have number of particles versus kinetic energy. And typically, it looks something like that. 
where you have, again, uh, at low kinetic energy, you have a small number of particles. So if you pick any of these low values, you get a relatively low number of particles. And you have a few that have very high velocities up at the higher end. And most of them are somewhere in the vast middle. The average would be somewhere around here. Uh, for the average kinetic energy, somewhere around the peak usually. And the distribution can look somewhat different depending on things like the mass of the, of the particles and how the temperature changes. Okay, so the uh, distribution of velocities uh, typically looks something like this, but um, heavier molecules And this actually, I meant to be velocity here. Uh, uh, typically, heavier molecules have lower root mean square velocities and a narrower distribution. So uh, really relatively heavy molecules might look something more like that. And lighter molecules, tend to have higher root mean square velocities and broader distributions. And so lighter molecules would tend to look more like that. <clears throat> and what we've got here, what I originally drew is something for say a medium sized molecule. If you were to, um, change the temperature, uh, basically increasing the temperature produces the same kind of curve that you get for lighter molecules. Let's get it on the screen. They're uh, broader and higher, basically, because increasing temperature will certainly increase the um, root mean square velocity. I mean, obviously it's going to, you know, the particles are gonna move faster if, if you heat them up. But it also broadens the distribution. And decreasing the temperature does the opposite. So if you take a sample of you know one particular gas and you and you start changing the temperature, uh, basically you go if you uh, increase the temperature, you go from the curve I originally drew up above here to a curve that looks more like the higher broader curve. And if you uh, decrease the temperature, you end up with a curve that looks more like this taller narrower curve at lower speeds. Okay, so um, I think that brings us to about 30 minutes. So I'm gonna stop the first segment there and I'll be right back.